Have you ever considered the purity of the water that comes out of your tap? Have you ever considered the difference between water in the environment and water that's been municipally treated that we drink that comes out of our faucets, refrigerators, and that we use in our toilets, for example? In this experiment, called water quality testing, we're going to investigate samples that you bring in from the environment and from the built structures around us for two important components, dissolved oxygen and chloride. Now, these aren't environmental pollutants per se. Dissolved oxy oxygen is actually really important for aquatic life and chloride is an important component of our water as well. But these are affected by climate change and profoundly affected by the environment as well. So for example, oxygen being a gas decreases in solubility as the temperature rises and so dissolved oxygen tends to decrease with temperature. Chloride, we might imagine, could be impacted by rising ocean levels due to the melting of the polar ice caps, for example. So in this experiment, we're going to get a taste of analytical sampling and, and the idea of bringing in samples from different locations and looking at a geographically distributed set of samples that all of you bring in. And we're going to apply methods of titration and, and more generally quantitative analysis to the determination of these components. And so the methods and the techniques are going to feel fairly familiar, but the unique part of this experiment is that you're going to bring in some of the samples for analysis. For the first part of this experiment, you're actually going to collect a water sample from your home, dormitory, or another natural location around campus or around Atlanta. So this does not have to be a municipal water sample. It doesn't have to be something that's come out of the faucet. In fact, I would almost prefer that it be something environmental just so that we get a nice diversity of samples. So this can be either municipal or environmental. And under the mantle of environmental, I want to emphasize this doesn't have to come from a body of water, a permanent body of water. It can come from rainwater, a temporary puddle created by something like a water main leak or, or something along those lines. It is important though that you describe your sample on the map that I'm going to send out with the student notes for this experiment. So there's going to be a link to a Google map where you're actually able to pin your sample. So indicate where the location uh, in Atlanta is that you obtained your sample from, and you want to describe when you're adding this pen where it came from. So specifically, is it municipal or environmental? Um, did it come from a faucet, toilet, bathtub, etc.? Uh, if it's environmental, was it rainwater? Was it a permanent body of water? What kind of body of water was it? And that kind of thing. And then, of course, add your name. We're going to go back to this after the experiment and add the results together and my hope is that eventually we'll be able to create a, a kind of heat map of the measured parameters uh, so that we can look at water quality around campus and ideally around Atlanta. So you'll want to map it and then it's important to get enough volume that we can actually perform all the necessary experiments and for our purposes to be on the safe side that's going to be about 300 milliliters if you're collecting in something like a water bottle that's going to be about 10 ounces think carefully about the sampling process. So realize that, uh, for example, sitting out in the open air may impact the quality of the sample. So it may be a good idea, uh, for example, to seal it off with a lid or inside a thermos or something so that dust and other contaminants can't get into the sample. That's especially important if you collect it early. Aside from that, pretty much the sky's the limit on your water sample. Um, I would encourage you to be creative in this and, and pick a sample that you're really interested in exploring for this experiment. Let's talk now about the specific analytical tests we're going to use to determine chloride and dissolved oxygen in our samples. The first important point I want to make here is that this is basically a titration, but it's not a titration in the sense you may be used to it from what we've done so far in 1212K. So you're probably used to the mechanics of a titration involving a burette and a stopcock and that kind of thing. In this experiment, we're doing a titration at a, at a much smaller scale where we're replacing the burette actually with a pipette. And in fact, rather than measuring the volume of liquid delivered, we're actually going to measure the mass of liquid delivered using a balance. So it's a little bit of a different technique and one that's going to rely on accurate measurement of 
the masses of solutions and an understanding of concentration in terms of mass. So using things like the mass of solution instead of the volume of solution in concentration measures. Chloride is the Cl- anion and you're, you may be familiar with the behavior of chloride in aqueous solutions, and specifically this idea that it loves to get together with silver and precipitate out. So the basis of our titration will be this very familiar precipitation reaction between silver cation and chloride anion. A solution of silver nitrate specifically, NO3 is just going to serve as a spectator ion here, is going to serve as our titrant. And chloride, specifically the chloride that's in our water sample, is going to serve as the analyte. That means that inside this pipette we're going to have a solution of AgNO3 and we're going to add that to a known volume of our water sample ideally containing some chloride. As we add the silver in we're going to see AgCl precipitate form but it's difficult to tell when that process is complete right since the silver chloride solid is going to fill the entire beaker and it's, and it's going to kind of create a mess so we need a way to kind of see beyond the solid mess that's created to the end point of the titration and to, to see that we're going to make use of an indicator specifically an indicator for AG+. The reason we want to do this is that at the moment we have excess AG+, in other words at the end point of this titration, as soon as we've added just enough Ag plus to consume the chloride, we're going to see something happen. We're going to see a color change due to this indicator. Specifically, the indicator we're going to use is chromate, CrO4 2 minus, in the form of potassium chromate that will be provided as a solution to you. When the aqueous chromate indicator gets together with silver ion, we end up with an orange complex which is readily visible inside that beaker. But this doesn't happen until all of the Ag plus that we've added has been consumed by chloride. In other words, this reaction up here at the top is more rapid than this complex formation and so we're going to get the precipitate formation instead of the formation of the orange complex. It's only at the moment when we've reached the end point of the titration, in other words there's no more Cl- left to react that we see this orange complex coming in. So look for the formation of an orange complex here at the, end, at the end point. And of course, don't forget to add the chromate indicator before you start titrating with silver nitrate. The concentration of chloride in municipal and environmental samples is not very high, so it's not going to take much titrant to get this done. Be very careful in your measurements. Make sure you don't lose any titrant after you've got the initial mass of the pipette plus titrant. Make sure you don't lose any more when you go to determine the final mass of remaining titrant and the pipette. Accurate results are going to depend on careful technique here and we don't have a great measure of what the answer is supposed to be quote unquote because we don't really know. You're bringing in the sample. That's the beauty of this experiment. But this is the essence of the determination of chloride and you're going to do this with your samples as well as a seawater sample that's going to be prepared in advance that's going to have a much larger concentration of chloride within it to make the analysis a little bit easier. So I would encourage you to do this seawater analysis first since it's a little bit more forgiving, shall we say, and then move on to analyzing your actual samples which contain a much smaller concentration of chloride. Finally, let's talk about how we're going to determine the concentration of dissolved oxygen or aqueous O2 in our samples. This involves a rather more complicated series of reactions but really ultimately relies on the ability of O2 to act as an oxidant and, and specifically the ability of O2 to oxidize manganese 2 plus to manganese 3 plus. So we're going to start by mixing manganese with hydroxide to form an insoluble precipitate of manganese 2 hydroxide and to understand the reactions and what's going on here it is important to consider the oxidation state, so do notice that the oxidation state of Mn here is plus 2. This is really a preliminary step, and where oxygen enters the picture is in the oxidation of the manganese 2 plus here to manganese 3 plus. And so 4 moles of this manganese hydroxide solid, this manganese 2 hydroxide solid, 
are going to react with one mole of aqueous O2 and two moles of liquid water to form manganese 3 hydroxide. Notice the three hydroxides in the formula. We've gone from Mn2 plus to Mn3 plus in an oxidation state of plus 3. The next reaction simply solubilizes the manganese 3 hydroxide. It's still a solid, but after treating it with three equivalents of H2SO4, we end up with essentially dissolved manganese 3 sulfate. Two Mn3 pluses, three sulfates, SO4, two minus, and six waters, which come from the protonation of the six hydroxide groups within the MnOH3s. In an ideal world, we would be able to analyze the manganese 3 directly, but we can't do that. We need to use it to synthesize something that we can readily analyze, and that's the purpose of the next series of reactions. At this point, we're going to add iodide to the solution, and what that is going to do is engage in a redox reaction with the Mn3+. So Mn3 plus has the ability to oxidize I minus to form two Mn2 pluses. Notice that we're back to manganese 2 plus now, and I2. And because we're using an excess of iodide, the next reaction that occurs is going to occur naturally as we add the iodide. The I minus is going to get together with the I2 that's generated and form what for us now is an old friend, the triiodide ion I3 minus. We're going to be able to detect the presence of I3 minus because starch indicator will be added to the solution, making it blue as the triiodide complexes to the starch. However, we're going to then add as a limiting reagent, as a titrant, the thiosulfate anion S2O3 2 minus. So everything to this point has been added in excess with the exception of O2, which is serving as our limiting reagent. So the concentration of O2 is going to be very small. Everything else is in huge excess so that when we get down to triiodide, the amount of triiodide depends directly on the concentration of O2 and on nothing else that we've added. Everything else is in excess. Two moles of S2O3 2 minus can combine with one mole of the I3 minus anion to essentially re-reduce it back to iodide, forming three I minuses, and forming S4O6 2 minus. And S2O3 2 minus is serving as our titrant. So we're going to take a solution of sodium thiosulfate and add it dropwise to our sample after adding the manganese, the base, the sulfuric acid, and the iodide. That's kind of a mouthful, but all that's leading up to the production of I3 minus, which we then titrate with the thiosulfate. At the end point of the titration, we're going to go from a blue solution due to the complexation between the I3 minus and the starch to a colorless solution because at the end point, the thiosulfate will have just consumed all of the I3 minus. I realize at this point, this looks like a lot to take in. Operationally, it's fairly straightforward. You're going to add the excess reagents and then very, very carefully add the titrant to the pre-treated sample until it turns from blue to colorless. Another thing to realize here is with everything else in excess, we can determine the molar ratio of dissolved oxygen to thiosulfate just by looking at these equations and sort of stepping our way through the molar ratio. So for example, taking the moles of O2 to the moles of MnOH3, the moles of MnOH3 to the moles of Mn3+, moles of Mn3+, to the moles of triiodide, and then the moles of triiodide to the moles of S2O3 2 minus. The pre-lab is going to ask you to do this, and it's an important prerequisite step in understanding the titration, since you're going to have to convert, quote unquote, from the moles of thiosulfate that you added to the moles of dissolved oxygen in the original sample. And this isn't as simple as applying a very straightforward molar ratio here, since multiple reactions are involved to convert the oxygen into a form that we can readily detect, namely the triiodide. So on your own, try working your way from the moles of O2 all the way to the moles of I3 minus and then ultimately to the moles of titrant so that the calculations 
for this titration are made easier.